It is mid-afternoon when Charizard touches down on the northwesternmost coast of Ula Ula Island, having taken the most direct route due to its usual passenger load being tripled. Having missed lunch, our heroes decide to stop here for a quick snack, and as Ash sets to work laying out the food with Hakamoo's help, Lily makes conversation with Kiawe, concernedly asking if his absence from the ranch will cause his family issues. Sweat dropping, Kiawe admits that while he was one of the main contributors in terms of labor, he was also another mouth to feed, and as a growing boy, he was the biggest mouth they had to feed other than old Meanie. So by taking both him and the bull out of the equation, she's probably done his parents a huge favor. Lily smiles a bit at that thought, though there is definite worry behind her eyes, having appeared when the subject of old Meanie had been broached. Having a good idea what this is all about, Kiawe smilingly promises to help Lily get the creature under control, since it's the least he can do. Curiosity surpassing worry, Lily asks what happened to make Meanie so wild, and with a grin, Kiawe explains that it was once a rogue totem Pokemon that got empowered by some sort of mistake and did a ton of damage. Coming over to join them, Ash cheers that it sounds pretty interesting to him, somewhat patting that he hadn't thought to catch the ball Pokemon himself, though even if he didn't catch it, he can at least still battle it, asking Lily if she'd be interested in having a practice battle after their meal. Kiawe encourages this, and even offers to help coach Lily. Feeling buoyed by the kindness of her friends and once again being curious at what a friendly battle may feel like, she agrees. Not wanting to be left out, Snowy yips in her arms, and with a smile she asks if Ash would agree to a two-on-two, -two before blushing and wondering if that's how her brother would have asked, and if that's too forceful. Ash happily agrees, and scarfs down the oatmeal and moomoo milk they'd stopped to enjoy, before going off to look for a good area to battle. It doesn't take Ash long to find a suitably spacious battlefield for Meanie to move freely in, though he is a little surprised not to have run to any people or Pokemon along the way. But nonetheless, he sends Rufflet to retrieve Kiawe and Lily, with them arriving soon after, and adding their agreement that this will be the site of Lily's first ever battle. Kiawe agrees to ref, announcing the rules for Lily's sake, and telling Ash as her senior in a battle to call his Pokemon forth first. Knowing she'd be using Snowy, and that roughly may be too much for a baby Pokemon to handle, he decides this could be the perfect opportunity to begin helping Cubone build some confidence. However, underestimating Lily and her Pokemon proves to be a critical error, since Snowy is a prodigy battler, and ends up decimating Cubone in an opening salvo with a powder snow, sending it crying to Ash where it spends the rest of the battle tucked under his shirt in a ball, as he tries to convince it that it isn't going to die of hypothermia from that little chill. Next out he calls Akamo, excited to test his new limits and begin helping him to exceed them. Lily gives a nervous look to Kiawe, and he encourages her as Ash and Hakamo want to fight. She gulps, then with fumbling fingers, releases Meanie. The foul-tempered bull rushes at Ash and Hakamo as soon as he sees them. And so Ash, thinking strategically, tells his partner to use reversal. However, when Hakamo rushes in to meet the oncoming attack, the move he uses is not reversal. With the pump of his newly acquired fist, Hakamo hooks Meanie under the jaw and sends his massive opponent tottering back onto its hind legs, struggling to regain its balance after such a powerful sky uppercut. Here, Hakamo surprises Ash further, not falling back into a defensive stance like he normally would as a Jangmo, and instead charging in for another sky uppercut. Unfortunately for the dragon type, Meanie's pride has been wounded gravely enough that it is actually willing to listen to his trainer, and so at Lily's command, hits Hakamo over the scary face. As a result, he is outsped and gets hit with a powerful takedown as Lily cheers it on, though Kiawe warns that she shouldn't necessarily praise it when it attacks with other order, as that could build bad habits. As if by prophecy, the Tauros again charges in only for Ash to order Hakamo to wait and charge with his Sky Uppercut. Trusting Ash, he stands still and waits till the last possible second, before pivoting out of Meanie's sight and using his rotation for added power to lodge his glowing fist into Meanie's soft underbelly. This second super effective hit launching the nearly 400 pound Pokemon into the air where it spins end over end before crashing face first in the dirt. This obviously knocks Meanie out and ties Ash and Lily with a victory each. Excitedly, Ash and Hakamo run up and hug her, congratulating that as an amazing first battle, and asking if she wouldn't mind helping him train alongside Kiawe in the future. Seeing the benefit in such an offer, she happily accepts and returns the hug, a pinkish blush coloring her normally pale countenance. Though, the color does drain away again as she suddenly scampers out of the hug and behind Kiawe after recognizing Hakamo's strong claws and sharp fang-filled maw from the adolescent Drake grinning at her. At this point, a coarse and female voice from out of sight calls this display precious. She then teasingly asks if Ash is Lily's boyfriend, suggesting that loud and stupid aren't traits she looks for in a man, but hey, maybe that's what prissy little princesses want. Angrily, Ash and Kiawe demand whoever's saying this nonsense come out and face them, and with a scoff, the speaker obliges, stepping out from a tree and showing herself to be a tall young woman with pink and yellow hair and the symbol of Team Skull tattooed on her midriff. She then crows that it's pretty presumptuous of these brats to be spitting 
making demands since they're trespassing on her land, but since they are, they're gonna have to beat her in a battle or pay the price. As the only member of the team without an injured Pokemon, Kiawe volunteers to battle the woman for them, and this makes her cackle, saying she hoped he was gonna say that, since he looks like the fun one in that group. She then shoots him a wink, saying her name is Plumeria, and that there's always a place in Team Skull for guys like him. Kiawe is initially very uncomfortable at this flirty overture, but when Plumeria mentions Team Skull and confirms her affiliation with them, he snaps back into focus, telling her they tried to destroy his family business twice, so he'd never join them. Plumeria declares that's a pity, then brings out a Salazzle, while Kiawe meets it with his Charizard, and the battle begins. Having raised his Pokemon from an egg, Kiawe feels confident in Charizard's chances, however Plumeria quickly establishes herself as no slouch, when before Kiawe can even call for an attack, the speedy Salamander has already shot off a toxic, and badly poisoned Charizard. Charizard shudders, but Kiawe tells it to stand firm and use Flamethrower, and so the Flame Pokemon belches a torrent of fire which aims directly at Salazzle. Smirking, Plumeria orders Salazzle to jump away and follow up with a Fire Lash as she does. Using her lithe body, the Serpentine Seductress manages this with ease, dodging the flames and retaliating by manifesting a fiery whip in her hands. However, to everyone's shock and disgust, Plumeria orders her Pokemon to target Lily rather than Charizard. Desperately, Charizard flies in to intercept the attack, and this is exactly what Plumeria wants, having Slazzle twisted at the last second to wrap the lash around Charizard's throat and pull it taut. There is a searing sound, and then Charizard hits the ground, frantically trying to pull the choking cord off its throat as Salazzle bit by bit tightens it. Kiawe calls Plumeria a coward for these tactics, but this only annoys the woman, who snaps he's not welcome in Team Skull after all since he's a buzzkill, before telling Kiawe he can quit at any time. Kiawe refuses, instead telling Charizard to keep trying to break free, but as the poison has made its paws numb, its efforts have become clumsy and slow, and before long, it kills over from burns, poison, and lack of air, falling unconscious. To add insult to injury, Salazzle briefly attracts her whip before giving the lizard a lashing across the wings, which will surely result in a permanent scar. As Plumeria advances on the group, saying they lost, so it's time to pay up. Furiously, Kiawe asks what she wants, and Plumeria tells them they can each become grunts and work off their debt by stealing 100 Pokemon each, or they can pay the toll. Refusing to ever work for Team Skull, Kiawe demands to know how much the toll is, and Plumeria smirks that it doesn't really matter since a peon like him won't be able to afford it, as it's the highest price in Po Town. Bracing himself, Kiawe says he wants to know the amount either way, and with a sneering cackle, Plumeria declares it is 10 Poke Dollars. Each. The trio sweat drop at this, but Lily awkwardly says that she's got it covered, and from her bag pulls out 30 Poke Dollars, which she drops in Plumeria's palm. The older girl seems a little shocked by this turn of events, but after a moment she regains her aloof composure, telling them to get out of Team Skull territory since she didn't want to have to do a grunt orientation again anyway. With Charizard still too injured to fly them, Ash and Kiawe each take one of its wings and arms onto their shoulders, while Lily gingerly lifts his tail to make sure his flame isn't put out by being dragged along the ground. Together, they begin the slow march past the walled off Poe Town and further southeast in hopes of finding a Pokemon Center. Each step is a struggle under the immense weight of the lizard, though not one of them says a word of complaint, all far more concerned with getting Charizard to safety before it's too late. It takes over two hours of marching before our heroes catch sight of another person, and when they do, it is a lanky man with shaggy hair and glasses wandering alone down a dirt path. Frantically, Kiawe flags the man down, asking if there's a Pokemon Center nearby, but the man sadly shakes his head, saying the nearest one is in Meili City, and that's at least another hour away by foot. Tears fill Kiawe's eyes at this, and he clears that he doesn't know if Charizard can last that long considering the damage done to its windpipe. This heartfelt plea for a friend moves the man, and he says that it's not a Pokemon Center, but back at his place, he has a healing machine that he built himself, which might be powerful enough to get Charizard back on his feet long enough to get some real treatment. Kiawe rapturously thanks the stranger, but he shakes his shaggy head, telling the boy to hold off thanking him until he's actually helped, before joining them in carrying Charizard as he guides the kids back up the road he was traveling. The man's place soon turns out to be a giant observatory, and before long our group find themselves inside, as the shaggy man hooks up Kiawe's Charizard to a strange bed with dials and a screen on the side. When a faint yellow light begins to pulse around the fire type, the man at last straightens up, putting a hand on Kiawe's shoulder and saying the treatment will take a few hours, but Charizard will live. With red eyes, Kiawe thanks this man, right up until he realizes he doesn't even know his name. Chuckling that he got too caught up in the moment to introduce himself, the shaggy man explains that his name is Mulane and he is the observatory keeper. Malayne then invites his guests to join him for some food and drink while they wait for Charizard. Heading into a spacious living room, they find someone else is there, a red-headed boy with a pinched, sullen expression reading a magazine. When he sees them, the boy irritably asks what they're doing here, and Malayne smiles that they're their guests. This only seems to annoy the child more, as he grumbles something about them not touching his stuff or eating his snacks, before burying his face back behind the magazine. Kiawe and Lily give him little thought after this, allowing Malayne to guide them to their seats, 
but Ash stays where he is, staring curiously at the magazine. When Ash doesn't join them, Lily asks her friend what's wrong, and in response he points to the cover. On it is Cynthia, along with a man with red spiky hair, who Ash knows is Lance the Dragon Master, and the text says that in just over a week, the pair are set to face off in an exhibition match at the Indigo Plateau to kick off the next season of the Indigo League. Ash sighs that he wishes he could be there to see it, since his mum and Lance are two of the greatest dragon trainers in the world, but the ginger boy scoffs that these two so-called champions couldn't hold a candle to Big Mo. Angry at this slight against his mother, Ash snaps who asked him, and before a fight can break out, Mulane steps between the two, rubbing the back of his head and asking Ash to forgive his cousin, who he names as Sophocles. He then goes to explain that Sophocles has always idolised him since he is an ex-Kahuna candidate, and Kiawe nods, saying that his mother is the same, and he's always looked up to her strength. Ash, however, is not mollified, and grumbles that still doesn't give the other boy permission to talk down about his mother. Seeing as how words won't settle this, Mulane then offers a compromise. Why don't he and Ash have a battle? Ash is happy to accept this offer, but says he also wants Sophocles to battle, since that way he can prove the strength of his family. With a snide smirk, Sophocles agrees, and then to the surprise of the group, Kiawe steps up, asking to be Ash's partner. He says that it's only fair that if Sophocles and Mulane are teaming up, then he and Ash should do the same. Plus, if he's to achieve his dream of being the next Kahuna of Akala Island, he'll have to prove himself strong enough to take on an ex-Kahuna candidate. Ash, Sophocles, and Mulane all accept these terms, but before they can head outside for a battle, a heavy thump down the hall draws their attention. Running to see what has caused the noise, our heroes find Kiawe's Charizard lying on the floor, having seemingly tried to climb down from his treatment bed and collapsed due to the injury sustained to his wings. Hastily, Kiawe rushes to its side, apologizing that he knows waking up in a strange bed must have been startling, but it really should be back on the bed and finish healing. However, Charizard refuses, giving Mulane and Sophocles a glare that says it's her talk of their battle and now wants a chance to prove itself and earn some redemption. Sighing, Kiawe tells the others that Charizard normally isn't this stubborn, but sometimes when it feels like his pride has been wounded, it can be as hard-headed as a Rampardos. So unless he uses it here, it might get Huffy and set the observatory on fire. Gulping that he certainly doesn't want that, Mulane agrees to battle it, while Kiawe sternly states that if his injuries start acting up, he wants it to tap out. In response, Charizard rises to his feet, fixing his trainer with an equally hard look, conveying both that that is fine, and more importantly, that he's impatient to start the battle. Mulane then leads the group to the observatory's backyard, which is almost as large as Paniola Ranch's pastures, and says that this will be their battleground. Lily makes her way to the side to ref, while the four men call out their Pokemon in unison. Kiawe as expected uses Charizard, while Ash goes with Cubone, wants to give it some redemption and a chance to grow by working with Kiawe's toughest battler. Meanwhile, Sophocles opens with the Togedomaru, and Mulane chooses his signature partner, Alolan Dugtrio. A fifth Pokemon then takes to the field, Hakamo, though in this case, it is not to battle, but instead to cheer his little brother on, doing a rhythmic and exciting dance that makes the scales claim. At the heartwarming sight, Mulane praises this display of camaraderie between team members, and jokes that if Kakui were around, he'd be dying to study the effects such a bomb would have on the team's moves. Lily, curious about this, prepares to ask if the shaggy man knows the professor, but she is stopped by Sophocles who cuts in, asking to get the battle underway. What follows is a short match, as even without flight, Charizard's powerful flames are super effective on Dugtrio, while Cubone's ground type attacks are four times effective on Togedomaru, wiping it out after the first hit, and really increasing his confidence. With the battle concluded, Mulane congratulates Ash, Kiawe, Cubone, and Charizard on their team spirit, but Sophocles is less generous, calling their opponents dirty cheats, since that's the only way anyone could ever beat him in Big Mo. He then runs away crying, while Mulane looks on with a sad expression. Turning back to their guests, he says he'll go talk to his cousin. But Lily actually pipes up, saying she might be able to help since she's been in a similar place to him. Ash and Kiawe look at her with identical, puzzled expressions, wondering what she could mean by that. But Mulane thanks her for the help and gives her directions to Sophocles' room. The boys then head back inside, with Charizard finally acceding to Kiawe's request and finishing its treatment in the healing machine. As Mulane hooks Charizard back up to the machine, Ash hears Lily's voice down the corridor. Though he tries not to eavesdrop, the hallway acts like a microphone, and he hears every word. It seems that Lily is trying to relate to Sophocles by telling him about a painful story from her past, specifically about the day her brother abandoned her and her family. She tells him how hurt and lost she felt when this person she'd always looked up to suddenly fell short of all the expectations she'd unknowingly been putting on him. But when that happens, they can't just lash out or give up on those people. Instead, they have to support them even more, since this is the time they'll need it most. This strikes a chord with Sophocles, and moments later Ash hears his door swing open. Shortly after that, he and Lily make their way into the healing room, where Sophocles bows his head and humbly apologizes for his previous rudeness. Kiawe shrugs it off, but Ash is a bit more stern, adopting his best approximation of his mother's stern regal gaze and tone, before saying that he hopes Sophocles learns from this experience. 
However, the effort of being so serious proves too much for our hero, and so he quickly breaks into a smile, saying he forgives Sophocles, since he'd probably be just as hurt if someone beat Cynthia. Glad to see they're all friends now, Mulane encourages the kids to go do something fun, since he has to get back to work. Ash and friends all agree, and Sophocles even offers to show them his super secret fishing spot, as an apology for being such a jerk before. Following his lead, Ash, Lily, and Kiawe are all led to the nearby Starfall Hill, and into a cave nestled on the side of the hill. Wanting to act tough for Lily, Sophocles proudly declares there's nothing to fear in the dark while his Togedemaru is here to light up the tunnel. But this facade is swiftly broken when the first screech of a Zubat has him leaping back and cowering behind Ash and Kiawe. After this humbling experience, Sophocles remains quiet for the remainder of the trip, and so leads them to an underground lake. After this, he presents each of them with a fishing rod, and explains that this lake is special because it contains all sort of water Pokemon that can't be found on Ula Ula Island. Excited at what they might find, the four friends sit together and begin casting their lines. Ash is the first to make a catch, and it's an octillery. However, before he can make any move to battle it, the octopus Pokemon latches around his face and bombards him, and Kiawe who is sitting next to him, with Octazooka. It then uses this moment while the boys are recoiling from the hits to leap back into the lake and swim deep enough that they lose sight of it. Sophocles is next to make a catch, and it's a tentacle, which he does actually manage to battle. As an electric steel type, Togedemaru is the perfect opponent for Tentacool's poison attacks, and when it electrocutes the jellyfish Pokemon, Tentacool gives the battle up as hopeless, and flops his way back into the water as well. Finally, after a long lull, Lily makes the group's third catch. Pulling hard on her line, she causes Carvana to fly into the air and land right in front of her. However, instead of attacking like the others did, it gives the girl a toothy grin and begins to nuzzle her leg. Due to its ability being rough skinned though, this does result in Lily's leg getting a few minor cuts and grazes. But surprisingly, she doesn't seem to mind, welcoming its affection with a bit of a pain look and bending down to pet it. Thinking back on how far Lily has come in the last few weeks, Ash praises her, saying it's amazing that the girl who used to be afraid of touching any Pokemon is now willingly petting one that most trainers don't dare to touch. This makes the girl gasp, as she reveals that she'd almost forgotten how afraid she used to be, admitting that traveling with Snowy and even Meanie has really changed her whole perspective, and that this must have been what the professor was hoping would happen all along. She then guiltily asks that she should probably give him a call when they get back to the observatory. Since she hasn't spoken to him or Professor Burnett in a while, Ash agrees, saying he should call his mom as well, and so the group began packing up. However, when Lily bends down to place Carvana back on the water, it thrashes violently and leaps from her hands to nuzzle back at her leg again. Chuckling, Kiawe says he thinks Carvana doesn't want to say goodbye, and so Lily with a look of shock on her face asks if he would like to join her team. Carvana snaps his fangs once in a sign of yes, and so Lily taps his fin with the Pokeball, adding it to her roster. It is evening when our heroes return to the observatory, and Malane calls their arrival good timing since they're just in time to witness the meteor shower. Gathering around the giant telescope, the five humans and all their Pokemon and friends watch in awe as Minior fall from space, burst free of their rocky outer shells, and after a brief moment of radiance, return to the stars, becoming one with the universe once more. It is a moving sight, and one that those assembled will not soon forget. After this, Ash and Lily make good on their plans and so split off from the others to make their phone calls. Despite the time difference, Cynthia answers at once and is delighted to see Ash, though she is shocked to see him looking so serious. In a tone of worry, the Sinnoh champ asks her son what's wrong, and in a steely tone he replies with a question of his own, demanding to know why she didn't tell him that she was going to be battling Lance, when she knows he's always wanted to see a duel between Dragon Masters. Cynthia sweat drops at this, and admits that the match was meant to be a secret, just between her and Lance as a way for old friends to catch up and assess each other's current strength, but leave it to a man who has high collared capes as part of his casual wear to turn the whole thing into a spectacle. And so, now much to her chagrin, Cynthia says the match is going to take place at the Indigo Plateau. However, she does know one way she can make it up to Ash. Since the battle is now a high profile event, she can organize the League Association to fly Ash and his friends out to Kanto as her guests. This melts any frostiness Ash might have been feeling towards his mother, and he thanks her profusely before running off to tell Kiawe and Lily about their upcoming trip. When he reaches Lily, she is in the middle of her own call to Kukui and Burnett, and when they spot Ash in the background, they gesture for him to come join them. With a smile, Burnett explains that Kukui was just telling Lily how he has a business trip to Ula Ula tomorrow, and had suggested the kids would accompany him so they could catch up. Ash eagerly agrees, before stopping himself and remembering that technically the offer was made to Lily, not him. However, the blonde girl smiles that she already agreed, much to Ash's pleasure. The found family of four then set about making preparations for tomorrow, so that when Kukui does arrive at Mulane's door the following morning, Ash, Lily, and Kiawe are ready for him. Being old friends, Kukui and Mulane hug before the professor bestows the same physical affection on Ash and Lily. As for Kiawe, this being the first time they've met in person, he offers him a robust handshake, which the Akala boy accepts gratefully, expressing his admiration for the man's research into battling. Passion alighting in his eyes, Kukui asks Kiawe if he's much 
much of a battler, and with a wide grin, he replies that he is, with his dream being to one day become a Kala Island's kahuna, like his grandfather was before him. Beaming, Kukui calls this a good goal, promising that one day they'll have a battle to remember. He then asks if everyone is ready to go, and with a smile, Ash, Kiawe, and Lily all nod, following the professor down the winding road that leads from the observatory to the nearby Malie city. When they reach the city, Kiawe excuses himself, wanting to use this chance to have Charizard get checked out by Nurse Joy, while Kukui along with Ash and Lily continue on their original course, leaving the bustling urban area of Malie in favour of the more quiet and suburban section. As they walk, Ash inquires as to what they're doing here, and with a grin, Kukui answers that they're here to introduce a new trainer to his starter, so he can begin his Pokemon journey. Eyes sparkling, Lily calls this wonderful, saying they'll get to witness the beginning of a lifelong friendship. While just as hyped, Ash grins that he can't wait to see the starter Pokemon of the Alola region, and how different they are from the ones he grew up with. Soon the trio reach the house in question, and when Kukui knocks, a stocky boy with a mane of flame-coloured hair bursts forth, grinning that this must be that Kukui guy who's got his Pokemon. Unperturbed by this somewhat uncouth greeting, Kukui nods that he does, introducing Ash and Lily to Cross, before pulling two Pokeballs from his belt, and bringing forth a Litten-like house, and a small blue seal Pokemon with a big pink nose. Wrinkling his nose, Cross asks why there aren't three choices, and with a pacifying smile, Kukui answers that due to there only being two new trainers set to start this year, he didn't see the point in requesting his breeder friend supply him with multiple of the same Pokemon, just for them to hang around his lab for a year. Gruffly, Cross calls this fair, before bending down and demanding the starters show him what they got. At once, the Litten Cup pounces forward, attempting a fearsome roar that is somewhat marred by a fiery sneeze midway through, while the water type inches forward and shyly nuzzles Cross's leg in a gesture that radiates unconditional love. It does not take Cross long to decide which he wants, and so nudging the blue one away with a grunt of get lost loser, he picks up Litten, grinning that at least this one looks tough. This devastates the seal, who flees with tears in his eyes. And knowing that he has not fully discharged his duty to Cross, Kukui asks if Ash and Lily could take care of Poplio for him. Nodding, the pair depart, running after Poplio as it makes its way up to Molly Garden on the northern end of the city. With a heartbroken cry, the little water type flings itself into the park's lake, and not missing a beat, Ash follows, leaping headlong into the water, only to experience a painful belly flop as the lake is revealed to be quite shallow. This does, however, draw the attention of Poplio, who spins around to look at the human, clearly wondering why he did that. And being eye level with it, Ash makes use of his opportunity to smile and softly pat the starter's head. In a reassuring voice, he tells her that it's not a loser, no matter what that idiot said. This makes Poplio pause, and so Ash continues, saying that he'd love to have an awesome Pokemon like it on his team, a claim which makes Poplio's eyes light up as it eagerly claps his flippers in appreciation. This in turn makes Ash laugh, saying the water type is a funny one under that shy exterior, much to Poplio's delight. From the shore, Lily encourages Ash, saying that Poplio probably just needs a little bit of positive affirmation, having been turned down by two trainers already. This reminder saddens the seal, but Ash replies that Poplio shouldn't let that bother it, since one day a trainer will choose it, and the love that comes from being chosen is unlike anything else in the world. From behind Ash, a familiar voice suggests that he could be that trainer if he wants, and looking around, he spots Kakui, who has seemingly concluded his business with the cross and come to their aid. Beaming down at the pair, Kakui reminds Ash like he said, Cross and Hal were the only new trainers scheduled for this year, so it's not like he's holding this Poplio for anyone in particular. Smile growing enough to nearly blind him, Ash asks the professor if he's serious, and when Kakui nods, Ash then asks the water starter if he'd like to be a part of his team. Popolo's response is to nuzzle Ash's cheek, and taking this as a yes, he scoops her up into a hug. Happy things have worked out, Kakui tosses Ash's ball. As he does this, he also gives Ash a new blue Z crystal with a side on face of a Pokemon vaguely resembling Poplio embossed on it. Kukui explains that this is a Primarinium Z, the special Z crystal for Poplio's final form, Primarina. Elaborating that since Ash already has a Z-Ring, he sees no reason the boys shouldn't have this as well. And it would actually be another way for him to be a great help to his research if Ash and Poplio could master this Z-Move as well. Ash vows to do his best if and when Poplio evolves. And so he, Kakui, Lily, and Poplio depart from Melee Garden to meet up with Kiawe. The group find him outside the Pokemon Center with Charizard by his side, having finally made a full recovery thanks to Nurse Joy's ministrations. Elated at this, Ash and even Lily surprisingly run up to hug the big warm lizard. Thankfully he's okay. To celebrate this miraculous recovery and assure all is well, Charizard even confidently agrees to carry them all back to the observatory on his back, and as a result, it is a much quicker trip up the mountain than it was down. From here, Kakui bids the kids and Malayan farewell, returning to Mele Mele Island, while Ash gets to work continuing his training now with Populo and its other Pokemon. A few days pass this way, with Ash working and in turn playing even harder than he did in the lead up to his rematch with Olivia, a fact which confuses his friends, who ask why he's training so intently when they haven't even found this island's Kahuna yet. Grinning, Ash replies that this isn't for a trial bottle, it's so that when he reunites with her, he can show his mom just how strong he and his Pokemon have gotten. 
And so it is that a week after arriving on Ula Ula, a sleek helicopter wearing the Pokemon League logo touches down on the vast field behind Hokulani Observatory, and Ash, Lily, and Kiawe are there to meet it. Bidding farewell to Sophocles and Malayne, the trio then board with their Pokemon and are whisked away to the Kanto region. While Ash and Lily have both flown on helicopters before, this is a new experience for Kiawe, who has only ever experienced air travel on the back of a Charizard, and so excitedly explores as much of the cabin as he can until the pilot's terse voice instructs him to put his seat back on. When the helicopter touches down in Kanto, our hero is met by Cynthia and her entourage, as well as an amiable elderly gentleman who introduces himself as Charles Goodshow. He then explains that he will be their guide and chaperone while they are here in Viridian City. However, Cynthia says that's hardly necessary, explaining that Mr. Goodshow is in fact a very important man and the commissioner of the Pokemon League. Beneath his bushy beard, Mr. Goodshow blushes at such praise and says that he's always happy to help Cynthia out since he met her all those years ago when she was journeying through Kanto. Kiawe and Lily both exclaim that they never knew Cynthia did a Kanto journey, but the champ just smiles that most people don't. They assume she started in Sinnoh, since that's the league she gained notoriety in, but she actually competed in and lost several leagues before challenging the Sinnoh League. The idea of Cynthia losing a league baffles Ash's two companions, but Cynthia continues smiling, saying she treasures those losses just as much as her eventual victory because they taught her so much and shaped her into the trainer she is today. She then wryly adds that she has a particular fondness for a defeat here in Kanto since had she not been knocked out so early in the tournament, then Ash never would have come into her life. This makes Lily sigh at this display of motherly love, while Ash blushes a little and weakly chides his mum not to talk about that sort of stuff in front of his friends. Cynthia seems undeterred by her son's protestations and pulls him into a hug, while Goodshow directs the others away to give the pair some space. A while later, a much happier looking Ash and Cynthia rejoin their friends in a limo, which takes them to one of Viridian City's premier hotels. Here they are each given a room key and told to enjoy the amenities. However, after the day they've had, Ash, Lily, and Kiawe only want one thing, and that is to sleep. Ash's dreams that night are filled with long epic battles between his mother's Garchomp and Lance's dragons, and when he rises the next morning, he is eager to see them become a reality. However, much to his chagrin, when Ash goes to find his mother, he is informed by one of Mr. Goodshow's aides that she was called away to the Indigo Plateau for final preparation. In a sulky tone, Ash asks why she had to be called in so early if the match isn't until tonight, but the aide dryly responds that perhaps Mr. Goodshow didn't want to repeat of Cynthia's entrance back at the Battle Dome. Ash has no retort for this, and so heads off to find his friends. When he reaches her room, Ash finds Lily perusing a guidebook, and seeing the put-out look on the boy's face, she suggests that perhaps he'd like to join her on an excursion to Pallet Town, since it's not too far, and is said to be home to Professor Oak, one of the world's leading Pokemon experts. From her excited tone, Ash can tell that Lily really wants to meet this professor, and so with a smile, agrees to come check out his lab with her. Never want to pass up a chance for adventure, Kiawe also chooses to tag along, with the trio setting out at once. Due to it being a beautiful day, the friends decide to walk to Pallet Town rather than fly or take a car, and after a pleasant stroll through both dense forests and rolling plains lands, they finally arrive at Pallet. Here, they immediately make for the largest building on the main street, which they presume to be Professor Oak's lab, and when they knock on the door, are greeted by a young man around their age with spiky brown hair. Kiawe asks if this is Professor Oak, while Ash mutters that it can't be, since Oak's meant to be some old geezer, until Lily cuts in, saying maybe this is him, and he just has a really good skincare routine. This elicits a chuckle from out of their field of view, before an older man with graying sandy hair steps up behind the young man and says that he is Professor Oak, and as a matter of fact, he is rather proud of his skincare routine. This makes Ash sweat drop as he asks if Oak heard his geezer comment, to which the professor coyly says he must have missed it, having temporarily gone deaf because he's so old. He then warmly invites them inside, saying that he and his grandson Geary were just about to have some tea and debrief over his recent performance in the Silver Conference, and that they are welcome to join them. Never once to refuse an invitation, Ash, Lily, and Kiawe follow the professor and Geary into an open plan living room with a wall sized television which is paused on the image of a Blastoise firing a hydro pump in an attempt to counter a blaze against Fire Blast. However, they are not the room's only inhabitants, as our heroes soon discover a trio of young Kanto starter Pokemon also present, and all seem to be enjoying themselves. When they enter the room, a Bulbasaur is gnawing on one of the coffee table's legs, a Squirtle is napping inside his shell, and the Charmander is jumping up and down with all its might to try and grab hold of a tea kettle's handle. Eventually, the little fire type does manage to get its paws around the handle, and so pulls down, only for the kettle to spill over and tea to gush out. Ash, Kiawe, Oak, and Gary all yell for the Charmander to move, knowing that if a tea gets on its tail and extinguishes the flame, it will prove fatal for the young Pokemon. But Lily channeling those motherly instincts takes it a step further, diving across the room and putting herself between Charmander and the oncoming liquid so that the hot tea scalds her back, but Charmander remains safe and sound. 
As the last of the tea spills, the others approach Lily to see if she's alright. Though she can't stop wincing each time she moves, she tells them she's fine, as thankfully the kettle hadn't gotten as hot as possible yet. Hope commends her for her selflessness and bravery, and encourages Charmander to not be so reckless anymore, before directing her down the hall where she can find a change of clothes and some burn medicine. While Lily goes to change, with the guilty Charmander trailing at her heels, the others watch the end of Gary's match, seeing how despite Blastoise's best efforts, it is no match for Blaziken, and in the end, it falls, knocking Gary out of the tournament. Oak then stops the video and asks Gary if he knows why he lost, and angrily, Gary says it's because Harrison used Pokemon from Hoenn that he wasn't familiar with, but Oak shakes his head, saying that certainly put him at a disadvantage, but in the end, it was his own battle style that cost him the match, since he always prioritized brute strength instead of creating a battleless team. Gary grows even more heated, demanding to know if his Gramps is calling him a bad battler, but Oak sues that of course he isn't. He's just trying to help Gary debrief and maybe consider the possibility that battling isn't where his true strengths lie. He's being objective. Gary is at a loss for words here, and so Oak continues, saying that to him, Gary has always battled more like a scientist trying to find the most efficient route to victory rather than a tactician who might try for a complete victory, or one that used the opponent's strength against them. And so with that said, he wants to battle Gary today and see whether that revelation makes any difference to how he battles. Gary says he's game to battle his Gramps, but then another voice chimes in, Ashes. The son of Cynthia says that if Gary is struggling to take on Pokemon that he doesn't know, then he can help, since his Pokemon are all from different regions. Kiawe whispers that Ash is missing the point entirely, and besides, it's rude to butt in on family business. But Oak doesn't seem bothered, and so tells Ash that he would be happy to have the son of Sinnoh's champion act as his proxy. Gary is also happy to accept Ash's opponent, for some reason feeling an inherent need to prove himself better than this upstart, and so they head outside to begin what is decided will be a three-on-three -three battle. With it being his challenge, Ash accepts the first move in choice, and so brings out Cubone, having really been surprised by its power in the match with Mulane and Sophocles. To his pleasant surprise, when it emerges, it smacks its bone club on the ground in what Ash assumes is a sign of its readiness, only to be told by Kiawe that it's the same timing as Hakamoto's war dance, likely meaning it's using its surrogate big brother's move to psych itself up. Grinning, Ash says whatever works, before Gary chides that he thought Ash would be using foreign Pokemon, bragging that Cubone is hardly a new Pokemon to him, and even rattles off a few facts he knows about the creature from his grandfather's studies. He then accuses Ash of lying about his mother being a champion, only for the other boy to keep his cool as if imitating Cynthia once more, as he challenges Gary to come and find out how much he knows when it comes to battling. Taking this as a bluff and wanting to humiliate Ash, Gary responds by sending out his Electabuzz, which to his mind is its final evolution. Something Ash comments on, as Sinnoh is his home region, only for Gary to play it off as though he'd known all along. Cubone seems to lose a bit of heart upon seeing the size and likely experience difference between itself and its opponent, but Ash's encouragement gets it to focus up and heed its trainer's first command, which is to use Stomping Tantrum, hoping it can turn its fear into blind rage. However, Gary surprises the pair, showing off Electabuzz's versatility by having the Electro-type lunge forward and let loose an Ice Punch at full power that sends Cubone flying back and wailing in pain. Even after Olivia advised him again in such interference, Ash is not willing to put forth any less effort than his teammates, and so catches the little ground type, causing the two to bowl over in a small heap, as once again faced with a cold attack, Cubone clings to Ash in an attempt to warm up. Professor Oak then asks Ash if he wants to forfeit, while Gary begins to grow angry and claims that this was a waste of his time. After Oak hushes him, he looks back to see Ash coaxing Cubone out of his shirt in a peculiar way. Using the creature's club, he begins to clumsily tap the same rhythm Cubone had earlier, while cheering for it. Let's go Cubone, you're number one until finally the creature pops out of his shirt, even though tears are still in its eyes. Oak states the match will continue, but as soon as he does, Electabuzz is once again pouncing in for another ice punch, only for Ash to counter this one by ordering Cubone to block with its club. Here Cubone proves its small frame is just as powerful as any ground type as it holds its ground, though for its defiance, frost begins to spread from its bone and onto Cubone's hand, before quickly freezing it solid. Now the sun has begun to set, being low enough to fall behind the tree line of the property, and without the heat of the day to thaw the ground, type, it seems that Ash and Cubone are all but assured a loss here. Smirking, Gary says as much, before recognizing his grandfather hasn't called the match and looks closer to find what is holding him up, an eerie glow shimmering beneath the ice. Suddenly the ice around Cubone explodes in a torrent of spectral flames, as in its wake stands a new proud and powerful Marowak, who exudes a cool confidence in place of its former skittish demeanor. With an effort, Gary shakes off his surprise and orders Electabuzz to finish this off with a brick break. However, the move seems to have no effect, simply leaving Gary's Pokemon open for Marowak's sudden counter of Shadow Bone. Instead of spinning its bone in the manner normal for the attack, the Ghost and Fire type takes hold of the bone in both hands, gripping the bottom like a sword, and suddenly swiping up 
so the end lit and bluish green spectral flame strikes Selectabuzz's jaw hard enough to make it reel back in pain. Seeing their opening, Ash orders Marowak to finish its opponent off with Bone Rush. This time the club glows an earthy brown as Marowak suddenly grips it in the middle like a staff and spins it like a pinwheel, whacking Electabuzz with it multiple times in quick succession and finally overwhelming it to give Ash the first win of the battle. Rushing in, Ash hugs his once wimpiest team member to praise it for its bravery and congratulate it, adding on that with its new fire typing, he doesn't think the cold will ever be a problem again. Oak praises Ash's faith in his Pokemon and mentions being thankful his eyes are still as sharp as ever, lest he had missed the evolution beginning. He then asks Ash to inform Gary of what happened with his Brick Break, causing the smart aleck to feel pretty embarrassed after he just shot his mouth off. Ash tries to assuage his embarrassment by mentioning that he didn't know very much about new Pokemon or regional variants until he started traveling with his mother, and even then only recently did he have the maturity and attention span to actually get anything out of the excursions. Though he does agree with Professor Oak that Gary needs to be more open to learning, since there's always going to be something you don't know. Gary bristles and decides he won't let Ash win another match, asking if Ash knows anything about his next partner, Umbreon. This, however, makes Ash light up, as he quickly runs over and to Gary's shock, is able to get Umbreon's trust and affection instantly by scratching a particular spot behind his ear that Dark-type simply loves. Impressed, Ash begins praising Umbreon and Gary's care of it, explaining he's always had a soft spot for the Eevee line because of his mom's Glaceon being one of the few Pokemon able to play with him when he was young. Gary barks at him to get his head back in the battle, and after the perfect recreation of his mother's derpy, carefree expression, apologizes and returns to his side, whilst Umbreon nearly falls over after leaning into his scratching so hard. He then finally remembers to return Marowak since these weren't meant to be consecutive battles, and once again congratulates him and thanks him for his effort. Deciding it's best to save Hakamo for whatever Gary has left, Ash chooses Poplio as his second Pokemon, wanting to get a feel for its battling style while also showing Gary something he knows the Cantonian boy won't have seen. Gary for his part admits that this is a new one to him, though it doesn't matter since it'll go down all the same, telling Umbreon to start off and use Quick Attack. At once, Umbreon springs forth, speed blitzing and slamming into Poplio and sending the small seal flying. He then follows up with a Shadow Ball, but thankfully Ash has Poplio show off its special ability, creating a bubble in midair which acts as a shield, mitigating some of the damage. He then has Poplio create a second bubble to cushion this landing, coming to a stop beside his trainer, before telling it to retaliate with Water Gun. Eager to please, the little sea lion fires a torrent of water from its snout, but thanks to Umbreon's superior speed, it avoids this, then comes in for another quick attack. With the pained Arf, Poplio is sent toppling end over end, and before Ash can call for a counterattack, Umbreon is upon it once more with that oppressive speed, ending the match with a point blank shadow ball. From his side of the field, Gary grins that he thinks Ashy Boy started to underestimate him back there, and with a shake of his head, Ash admits that maybe he did. But that's all going to change here now, as he brings out his starter and strongest Pokemon, Hakamoo. Trainer and Pokemon then lock eyes, with Ash admitting that this is truly their first real battle together since Pong's betrayal. So the Drake doesn't feel up to battling, he won't force it. However, to the contrary, Hakamo looks fired up, smacking a paw into the scar the sharp-bladed traitor left in his wake as a symbol of readiness, then turning its fearsome red eyes on Gary. Sensing the seriousness radiating off Hakamo as he prepares to show that he is still a capable battler, Gary weighs his options. Alakazam or maybe Noctowl could both easily make use of the weakness this thing has as a fighting type. However, the fact that it is a dragon and a foreign one at that causes a bit of doubt to settle in his stomach as he hesitates, until his gramps suddenly gets his attention. Reiterating a question he'd asked after the Silver Conference, when he saw Blaziken, a foreign Pokemon he'd never seen or knew anything about, what did Gary feel? The younger Oak pauses before honestly answering, panic and fear. Oak nods and states that it's perfectly natural. However, just because it's natural doesn't mean he should let himself fall to it. If he doesn't know something, then he needs to find out about it, and the only way to do that is to be brave and follow both his heart and his head. Gary looks on at his grandfather, now finally starting to understand a bit of what he's been saying all this time. Looking back to Ash, he apologizes for how he acted so far and thanks him for this, but declares that he and his partner won't fail. To the field comes a large Blastoise that easily towers over Hakamoa, but instead of looking discouraged, the Dragon-type clings his scales louder at the challenge. After a moment, Oak tells them to begin, and Gary starts off by ordering Blastoise to fire off a Hydro Pump and keep Hakamoa at a distance. Reasoning that if it's a fighting type, then battling at a range will be something it is ill-equipped to do. This causes Ash and Hakamo to start off on the back foot, as not only does the dragon type have to narrowly dodge the initial beam of water, but he also has to run and evade the continuous stream from the rest of the attack. In spite of himself, Ash grows a tad more nervous, recognizing Blastoise is on a whole other level of power than Gary's other Pokemon. And so as the high pressure water subsides, he tells Hakamo to strike back with a high speed sky uppercut, reasoning that they dealt with one bulky brute this way, so why not another? Letting out a fierce growl that 
that indicates that Hakamo is on the same page as his trainer. The middle stage Drake closes the distance and slams his fist into Blastoise's chin. But to their horror, the blow seems meaningless as it isn't even enough to make Blastoise move his face more than an inch. It does, however, put Hakamo in perfect range for a point blank hydro pump, and on Gary's command, the turtle aims his cannons lower, launching a copious amount of water in a pressurized beam. Ash calls out for his first Pokemon to hold strong, but he can't even hear Hakamo's response for all the water, and so he is forced to wait, holding his breath in solidarity and hoping his friend will be alright. Finally, when the watery barrage subsides, Hakamo is hunkered down in a tight bowl, while all around him the ground has been cleaved away by the force of the water, which is a testament to both Blastoise's power and Hakamo's resilience. Gary curses the dragon type's water resistance, before declaring they have something for that though, as he orders Blastoise to take advantage of the water dripping from Hakamo's scales, and end this with Ice Beam. However, as the freezing energy begins to surge in Blastoise's mouth, Hakamo makes what will surely be his last chance at an attack, swinging a sky up cut, not at Blastoise, but at the muddy ground under the water type's feet. Due to Blastoise softening it up, this crumbles easily under the force of the dragon, causing the Cantonian starter to stumble forward, its attack missing Hakamo by a wide margin. This creates just the opening Ash needs, and so as Blastoise attempts to regain its footing, Ash tells his partner to end things with a suplex. Slipping behind the battle turtle, Hakamo grabs hold of its cannons, and using its instability leaps back, causing Blastoise to fall with it, slamming its head into the ground with enough force to end the match. When the last blow has been landed, Ash and Gary approach and shake hands, thanking each other for an amazing battle, before Gary turns to his grandfather and says he thinks he understands what Oak was trying to tell him. Oak smiles that he knew Gary would since he's a smart young man, before telling the assembled youth that they are free to explore his lab, and if they need anything, he will be inside. For the rest of the afternoon, the friends enjoy separate pleasures, with Lily going inside with Oak and Charman to discuss his Pokemon research, while Ash and Gary explore the corral together. Kiawe attempts to join them, but soon catches sight of a Cantonian dug trio, and spends the remainder of the day weeping over the tragedy of its baldness. This leaves Ash and Gary alone to talk, with the topic turning to their goals and dreams. For Ash it is simple, wanting to be as great as his mother, but Gary is less certain, admitting that after his mediocre performance in the Indigo League conference, he took a year off to train, thinking strength was what he lacked. But after his silver conference showing, in today's battle, he's starting to think his grandpa might be right, and competitive battling might not be his true calling, since he's already started to stagnate. Understanding the pain of self-doubt very well, Ash claps the Cantonian boy on the shoulder, saying it's okay if he's feeling uncertain, since even if he can't see the path anymore, he doesn't have to figure it out on his own. He has his friends, his family, and his Pokemon to rely on. Though, as his most recent opponent, he can assure the young oak that talent is not a field in which he is lacking. This does comfort Gary a bit, but he's still seems uncertain, so Ash adds that perhaps his path isn't a simple straight line, but instead a forked road, like his mum, who is both a world-renowned battler and an avid archaeologist, being equally proud of both vocations. Overhearing this, Professor Oak joins the boys with Lily at his side. Smiling fondly, he reminds his grandson that he hasn't always been a professor. He once took part in league conferences just like Gary, while Lily adds that Alola's regional professor, Professor Kikui, is both a researcher and a battler, his skill only being second to the Mask Royal, a claim which makes Oak chuckle ever so slightly as he thinks fondly of his old friend. These words of encouragement finally clear away Gary's funk, and rising to his feet, he thanks them all. He then turns to Ash, promising that one day when he's figured out who he truly wants to be, they will battle again. Standing as well, Ash grins that he looks forward to it, before he and Gary clasp hands, forging a bond of friendship that will transcend space and time to signify that though their goals may not be the same, their hearts beat as one. Eventually, night draws near, and in a moment of absent-mindedness worthy of his mother, Ash declares that they've got to go to the Indigo Plateau. Kiawe offers to fly them with Charizard, but Oak interjects, saying that since he and Gary are also attending the match, he can drive them. Ash, Lily, and Kiawe graciously accept, and so climb into the back of Oak's Jeep, though unbeknownst to them, there is also a stowaway in their midst. Arriving at the leak stadium with barely any time to spare, the group are all escorted to a private viewing box where Mr. Goodshow is waiting, though despite being the oldest amongst them, he seems just as excited as any of the kids to watch this battle, and so eagerly joins the discussion about the outcome of the match. Ash is of course certain that Cynthia will sweep Lance, since though he is a skilled Dragon Master, his mom is the strongest of all the regional champions. However, Oak encourages him not to count Lance out so soon, since he is older, has held his title longer, and is the champion of two regions rather than just one. Ash looks like he wants to make a counterpoint, but before he can, the lights go down and all attention is turned to the battlefield, where the pair of champions have just appeared. 
Cynthia fixes Lance with a cold glare, as Lance nervously chuckles and reiterates some earlier apology he made to her. Cynthia remains quiet and still, while Lance sweat drops, and he tries to encourage her by saying this would be a perfect opportunity to let Dragonite and Guard Trump blow off some steam and get a proper workout, only capable between two dragons. To Lance's horror though, Cynthia playfully turns her nose up at his words, and acts aloof, a lot like a certain Dark Type Elite 4 member always gunning for his title. Even in front of multiple guests and cameras, Lance's bravado drops for a moment. He becomes a bit red in the face from embarrassment and frustration as he once again states his being sorry and that the news slipping was an honest mistake. He then pleads for Cynthia not to be so cruel to him. Now hitting the bargaining phase of grief, he even suggests that maybe she could at least let that new Hakamoa he's heard so much about go up against his Aerodactyl, as it would be a perfect sparring partner to help her begin synchronizing with it. But Cynthia simply tells him that sweet talk will get him nowhere, urging him to finally pick his Pokemon. His hopes dashed, Lance makes a last minute gamble by choosing to go with Dragonite, in hopes he will see Cynthia have a change of heart. It does not, and without a shred of mercy, Cynthia brings out Togekiss, whose mere presence causes the Dragon Master and his Drake to shiver. As the referee finally announces the match to begin, Lance decides to play it smart and show that neither he nor Dragonite will stand for this as they open with Dragon Dance, which causes the Dragon Pokemon to begin moving as a blur. Ash, however, as someone who is used to watching champion caliber battles is able to keep pace, witnessing as Cynthia has Togekiss release a shockwave which renders Lance's speed buff useless as the Bolt of Lightning zeroes in on the Orange Dragon before it can even move. Nonetheless, Lance is not champion for nothing, responding with an Iron Tail, but Togekiss gracefully dodges by executing a flawless barrel roll as Cynthia repeats her command of Shockwave. This hits True Luck the first, creating an opening for a follow-up Moonblast, much to Lily and Snowy's shock as they both watch on in awe at how powerful the move can be. Such is the Moonblast strength that even a pseudo-legendary is knocked to the ground with a cloud of dust forming around it. Anxiously, the commentator speculates that this is the end for their beloved champion, but when the cloud clears, Dragonite is miraculously still on his feet, after blocking the blunt of the attack with its Iron Tail. However, Cynthia and Tokikiss don't let up, and end the match with another shockwave which Iron Tail can do nothing to protect against. As the referee calls the match to a close, Cynthia sweetly advises Lance to be more tactful next time they make casual plans as friends, that is, unless he enjoys being handed crushing defeats. Chuckling, Lance nods at this advice, saying that he'll remember that in the future. Though the validity of those words are almost immediately put to the test when he decides that he really had looked forward to facing one of her dragons, since he'd heard the way that she raised him was comparable, if not better, than her mother. At once, all sweetness is gone, and an expression of cold fury crosses the Sinnoh champ's face. Ash himself has only seen this true dragon rage from his mother once or twice in his life, and he knows that whatever Cynthia says or does next will be something Lance will never forget. However, instead of any grand displays of anger, Cynthia just mutters something in a low voice that the various cameras and microphones around the ring can't pick up. Even Ash can't guess what it is that his mother is saying, but he suspects that it's something to do with why Cynthia never talks about her own mom. When Cynthia is done speaking, Lance is pale, with a gone expression like his soul has left his body, and when the mics finally pick up on her asking if he understands, the red-headed Dragon Master gives a stiff nod, and then walks out of the ring without a word or any of his usual flourish. This time, Ash doesn't have to fight and sneak around to gain access to his mother. After the match, he and his friends along with Oak, Gary, and Mr. Goodshow are all escorted to her dressing room, where Ash is happy to see Cynthia in a much better mood. The champ then asks if they all enjoyed the match, with the boys all eagerly telling her they did, while Lily a tad nervously asks if Cynthia will be willing to give her some notes on how to make such a powerful but controlled Moonblast. Cynthia promises to do just that tomorrow, before asking the kids to give her, Mr. Goodshow, and the professor a moment alone to talk. Ash agrees, and so leads his three friends back out to Oak's Jeep, only to find the tarp covering the truck bed on fire. Acting as a cohesive unit, Ash and Kiawe pull the burning sheet off, while Gary calls out his Blastoise to put out the flames now there's no danger of its hydro pump damaging the vehicle. Meanwhile, Lily steps in to find the cause of the blaze, only to see the Charmander from earlier curled up in the truck bed fast asleep, with its flame tail close to where the tarp had been. As if it senses Lily's presence, the lizard Pokemon awakens, and upon seeing her leaps into her arms, Lily catches it without hesitation, but does give it a light admonishment for being careless, as if that flame had spread to the gas tank, it and anyone else around would have been seriously hurt. Charmander hangs its head at this, and Kiawe comes over to take a look, saying he doesn't understand why Charmander would have snuck onto Oak's Jeep like this. However, at that moment the professor strides into view, having come at the sound of the commotion, and says that he has a theory. He then tells the kids that this Charmander has always been rambunctious and prone to getting in trouble when its curiosity and wanderlust got the better of its common sense. But after the incident with the tea, it seems to have taken a real shine to Lily, having seen someone willing to put themselves in harm's way for it. He therefore posits that it came out here for a chance to ask to be part of Lily's team. Lily then looks down at the little flame lizard, asking if this is true, and Charmander nods, yapping happily. 
When the professor gives his blessing with a nod, Lily pulls out a Pokeball and bonks Charmander on the head, turning into red light and sucking it into the ball. Ash congratulates Lily on another capture, while Kiawe mournfully comments that this means now he is the least amount of Pokemon on the team, making Ash and Lily laugh. After this, the group go their separate ways, with the Oaks heading back to Pallet Town, while Ash, Lily, and Kiawe make for their hotel. Here they are greeted by Cynthia, who invites them to join her for dinner at a local buffet, an offer that all three readily accept. From here, the rest of the evening is spent going over the match and sharing the story of their adventures at Oaks Lab. Eventually, Lily does get her chance to speak with Cynthia about training up Snowy's Moonblast, and while the two women chat, Ash and Kiawe decide to engage in an eating contest, which ends with no winners and two sore stomachs. The next day, Hyawe and Lily decide to explore the city together, while Ash surprises them by saying he thinks he'll just hang around the hotel with his mom, since he's really missed her these last few weeks. Hyawe says he understands, since being so far from home has made him miss his mom too, but Lily purses her lips, saying nothing and following Hyawe when he departs. Viridian City proves to be a buzzing metropolitan on a whole other level from anything in Alola, and so the two friends spend their morning exploring malls and galleries, and even stopping in in a movie theater to watch Brightson Man Strikes Back Harder. After this, they break for lunch, and thanks to Lily's trusty guidebook, they decide to check out Viridian City's famous Pizzeria de Cassidy e Butch. Though unfortunately, the guidebook contains a typo, calling it Pizzeria de Cassidy e Beef instead. Inside the pizzeria, the friends split a pie, and just as they are prepared to dig in, a shrill howl draws their attention towards the kitchen. A man's voice then rings out, demanding that the target of his ire considers this medium rare. Then the sound of metal hitting flesh, and another of the same howls. Recognizing trouble when they hear it, Lily and Kiawe leap over the counter much to the protest of the ladies serving and barge their way into the kitchen. What meets them there is a green-haired man smacking a Cantonian Vulpix with a skillet, and the poor Pokemon skidding into a corner where it collapses with a weak yelp. Rage and disgust fill our heroes, and so Lily steps up, bringing out her own Vulpix and ordering Snowy to use Powder Snow on the man, freezing them into the wall. While Kiawe runs over to the wounded Vulpix and checks his vital signs, when it's clear that the little Pokemon is alive, he cradles it in his hands, yelling at the green-haired man with a rage hotter than his homeland's volcano as he demands to know how he could do such a thing. The man spits back that he doesn't have to answer some snot-nosed kids, but Lily flatly interjects that he will have to answer to Officer Jenny for Pokemon cruelty. However, all this bellowing doesn't go unnoticed, and the ginger-haired woman from behind the counter soon barges in, demanding to know what the heck Hutch has gotten himself into. He protests that his name is Butch, before saying these kids attacked him, to which Kiawe and Lily try to justify that they were just helping Vulpix. Unfortunately for them, the woman seems to share her partner's lack of regard for Pokemon, and so instead, brings forth a mighty Anna which slams into Snowy and knocks the young Pokemon out in one hit. Catching her partner as he falls, Lily clutches Snowy close to her chest, then looks at Kiawe for guidance as to what they should do now, since both of them have their hands full with the wounded Vulpix. Kiawe thinks for only a moment, then to the shock of everyone, Shoulder charges the back door and runs into the alleyway behind the pizzeria. Not needing to be told twice, Lily follows suit, and is soon in step with Kiawe. However, this just makes them an easier target for mighty Anna's dark pulse, and so the pair decide to split up, with Lily going to get Officer Jenny, while Kiawe takes the abused Vulpix and his joy. The pair nod, then run in opposite directions, confusing Butch and Cassie, who stop to bigger over who they should go after, and in doing so, lose sight of both of them. Meanwhile, back at the hotel, Ash and Cynthia are having a relaxing mother's Sunday, getting room service ice cream and watching a cheesy movie set in Sinnoh back when it was called Hiswi. When the credits roll, both agree that Spielbunks really lost his touch since Pokemon in Love, with Ash commenting that the old story Cynthia used to tell him would make a better movie. When the champ asks which one he means, Ash replies the one in Hiswi about the girl who defeated Volo and his Giratina. Briefly, Cynthia's face shifts into that same expression it had when she went quiet at the Indigo Plateau, but then turning on a dime, she laughs that she didn't think he'd remember a story from so long ago. Beaming, Ash replies that it's still his favourite since she always told it so well, and this causes his mother's expression to soften as she pulls him in close and in a low voice begins to recount the well-loved tale of the heroine Doracina and her loyal band of dragons. As she does this, Ash brings forth Hakamoo, who seems to appreciate the story, finding inspiration in heroics of the brave dragon type companions. Figuring that this is as good a chance as any, Cynthia also brings forth her Kamoo, and as the human mother and son take this time to enjoy each other's company, so do the draconic pair. Back in the city, Lily has finally managed to locate Officer Jenny, and so wastes no time in telling her about the abuse of Vulpix and the attack on her and Kiawe by Cassidy's Mightyana. Jenny takes this claim very serious, and heads off to investigate, while advising Lily to get Snowy healed up at the Pokemon Center. Being worried about her foxy friend, Lily heads over to the center, where she reunites with the relieved Kiawe, who informs her that Joy said Vulpix will be alright, but the bruising on its body is just that this attack was not the first time it had been mistreated by its owners. This deeply upsets Lily, just as it has Kiawe, with the pair wondering what they should do with the fire Vulpine once it's healed. 
This question is answered for them, however, when a little while later, Jenny finds Lee and Kiawe at the Pokemon Center, saying that thanks to them, she was able to apprehend two of the outstanding members of the now defunct Team Rocket, and offers them the reward money. The pair thank Jenny for the praise, but they say they're not too interested in a reward, being more concerned for the fate of Vulpix. Looking saddened at what the poor Pokemon must have endured under Butch and Cassidy, the officer suggests that maybe one of them would like to keep Vulpix, since it deserves a loving trainer to take care of it. Beaming, Kiawe says that he'll be happy to care for it, and Lily backs this up, encouraging that he was the one to actually rescue it. This is good enough for Jenny, who hands him its ball, saying that she took this off Butch when she arrested him. Smile only growing, Kiawe promises to do right by his new Pokemon, before heading off to ask Nurse Joy if he can see Vulpix now. It takes another few hours before Nurse Joy is ready to discharge Volpix, and by the time she does, Lily and Kiawe are already running late for their return flight. Rushing back to the hotel, they find a frantic Ash pacing up and down the sidewalk, while Cynthia and her staff are loading all their bags into the limo. When Ash sees them, he gestures for his friends to get in, since they were meant to leave a half hour ago, and the three hastily clamber into the back, while Cynthia waves them all off, promising to see them again soon. During the drive, Lily and Kiawe tell Ash all about their adventures, and he expresses a bit of jealousy at missing out, but says he enjoyed having a quiet day in with his mother, and that by watching her battle and train, he's picked up a few new tricks for his next grand trial. At the airfield, our heroes say their final goodbye, this time to Mr. Goodshow, though he tells them that he'll be seeing them all again at the Alola League, and he expects them all to work hard between now and then. In unison, Ash and Kiawe say they will, because they're going to win the league, but then to their shock, Lily, in a small but clearly determined voice, chimes in that she's decided to enter as well, and with Miss Cynthia's notes in her Pokemon by her side, she's going to give Ash and Kiawe a run for their money. This excites the boys, who say they won't go easy on her, and the three friends are in high spirits as they board their helicopter back to Alola. For the most part, the flight goes smoothly, and in time, Ash, Lily, and Kiawe all fall asleep in their seats. However, shortly before they are meant to make their landing, massive turbulence rocks the vessel, waking the passengers and causing them to look around hurriedly. For a fleeting second, Ash sees a blue and purple vortex with jagged white lightning shooting from its mouth, hovering over a building a bit to the west of Mount Lanakila. But just as soon as it appears, it is gone, along with the turbulence, and in the haze of sleep and the sudden return to normalcy, Ash promptly forgets it. About an hour later, our trio touch down in Meili City Airport, and to their surprise, are met by a small girl in a patchwork dress who they have never seen before, yet who is waiting patiently, as if they had a predetermined meeting. When Ash, Lily, and Kiawe step out of the helicopter, the girl beams at them like they are old friends, and says she's been waiting for them. Nonplussed, Ash asks who she is, and the girl conversationally states that she is the Grim Reaper, and that they all perished during their flight, so it is now up to her to escort them all to the afterlife. As one, our heroes gasp in horror, looking at each other for confirmation, before the girl cackles mischievously, saying that she's only kidding. Her name is Acerola, and she's been sent here to fetch them by her uncle Nanu, the Kahuna of Ula Ula Island. Here, Kiawe goes into Big Brother mode, scolding Acerola for such a mean-spirited joke, but Ash is too excited at the thought of meeting the next Kahuna to be mad, and so urges Acerola to lead the way. The dark humored girl giggles that she'd be happy to, and then begins taking them through a winding route that seems to span the entirety of Melee City, and takes several houses to traverse, before eventually coming to a stop at a police station three doors down from the airport, where a grey-haired man who they all assume is Nanu is waiting. Testily, the man demands to know what took Acerola so long to fetch these damn kids, but the girl just gives him a nonchalant smile, admitting that there was a cloud she wanted to follow since it looked just like her breakfast from three weeks ago, and she thought it might be a sign. Sighing, Nanu says of course she did, not even bothering to ask what it might be a sign of, before beckoning Ash, Lily, and Kiawe to come inside, telling them not to mind Acerola since she's got a very vivid imagination. A little put off by this odd pair, Ash takes the lead, confidently asking Nanu if he called him here to set up a grand trial, to which Nanu flatly replies that he did not. In fact, fact, if he had known Ash was doing the island challenge, he would have called someone else, since now Ash will want to cause him all sorts of hassle while making a battle. Kiawe, who takes great pride in the office of Kahuna, asks why he's even a Kahuna if he doesn't like battling, citing Mulane as a perfectly capable replacement. But Nanu shakes his head, saying the kid doesn't get it. Tapu Bulu chose him as Kahuna, and when a guardian deity sets someone a task, they do it, whether they like it or not. He always still seems unhappy with this answer, but accepts it, while Lily, being the most insightful of the group, poses the more pressing question. If not to arrange a battle, then why didn't Nanu call them here? Nanu chuckles that he likes this one, since she has her head screwed on straight, before gesturing to their surroundings and saying that on top of being Kahuna, he is also the police chief of Ula Ula Island, and heard from Hala and Olivia that their group knows how to deal with crooks and thugs. So, he's got a job for them, to drive those Team Skull brats out of Poe Town, since they've taken over the whole area and turned it into the little clubhouse, adding with a heavy sigh 
Sakai that if they do it, he supposes he'll be willing to give Ash his grand trial battle. The trio say they should have figured something like that had happened, when Plumeria told them that part of the island was Team Skull territory. And Nanu is surprised they know Plumeria, saying she is Guzma's vicious chief lieutenant, who spends most of her time robbing or driving away anyone who comes near Potown. The trio admit they know firsthand, explaining their run-in with her, with Kiawe fiercely saying that he wants to get payback for what she did to his Charizard. This gives Nanu a wry sense of amusement, and he coldly tells Kiawe that getting all hot-headed about the matter won't help anything. They need to strategize, take their time, and form an ironclad plan. Otherwise, they'll just get their butts kicked again. At this, Acerola pipes up with a look of feigned surprise on her mischievous face, asking if that's what her uncle's been doing all this time, and that she thought he was just really lazy. Nanu responds with a stern look at the girl, but even as three outsiders, Ash, Lily, and Kiawe can see a great deal of mutual affection shared between these two. Wanting to get back on topic, Lily asks if Nanu can give them any tips on how to take back Potown from Team Skull, and the older man rolls his eyes. Sighing that Olivia had told him that she was the smart one of the group, so it should be obvious, collect allies, and make a plan. Acerola adds that perhaps they should start with the other boy Nanu wanted her to bring, to which Nanu asks where he is, causing Acerola to shrug that she sent Mimikins to get him, so he could be anywhere. The chief grumbles that if that's the case, Ash and Co better go find him, since that scatty Mimikyu is just as likely to bring him to the spirit well as it is to bring him here before adding that Ash might remember him, since he's Howl's grandson. This makes the trio smile, happy to be working with Howl again. However, Nani reminds them of the possibility their friend could be lost in purgatory forever if they don't hurry. And so with haste, they depart, with Acerola falling after them, sing-songing she's going to look for Mimikins. While Nanu sits and reclines in a chair, quickly snoring away, a Meowth finding its way into his lap to join him in his catnap. It doesn't take them long to find their ponytailed friend sitting outside a cafe with a hearty helping of Malasadas on his plate. And with him is a shiny Mimikyu who is surreptitiously extending shadow hands and pulling Malasadas under her cloak when Howe isn't looking, only to profit more every time he kindly offers her one, none the wiser to a mischievous game. Acerola lightly chides the Mimikyu for not bringing Howe to Nanu like she was meant to, but Howe takes the blame for this, saying he got hungry and so Mimikins led him here for a snack. Acerola then adopts a sinister smile and cackles that this is perfect. Perfect. Since now he's eaten the Malasada cursed by a Mimikyu, he is doomed to be Mimikin's slave forever. How gulps, asking if this is true, but Acerola just bursts out in laughter saying that of course it isn't, before bidding them all farewell. She and Mimikins then depart, though on the way out, Acerola playfully suggests that if they all die in Po Town, they should try to come back as ghost Pokemon, so she can catch them and they can all play together. Not sure whether to be flattered or deeply creeped out, Ash, Lily, and Kiawe decide to use this as a segue to explain their mission for from Nanu. Upon hearing that they're going to be thwarting Team Skull in their base, Howe is eager to lend a hand, saying he feels sorry for all the poor people who got evicted when the villainous team took over. However, he adds that it might be a good idea to wait until Gladion gets back from his training trip. He then explains that a couple of nights ago, Gladion battled a Dragon-type trainer who completely demolished him, and since then he's been off training alone in Haina Desert. A worried expression then crosses Howe's face, and he admits that Gladion was meant to be back this morning, and that his food and water supply must have run out by now. At once, Lily heatedly demolished demands if Howard considered looking for him, and a shamefaced Howe admits that he was going to head to the desert this morning, but when that Mimikyu came with a summons from a Kahuna, he felt like he couldn't refuse. Ash pats his friend on the back, saying that one day they'll solve that confidence issue of his, before telling the others they should go now since there's no time to lose. Ash and Kiawe then rush off to find a place they can safely call out Charizard, while Howe and Lily lag behind. In a low voice, Howe says that he knows why Lily's so worried about Gladion, and that the blonde boy would be just as concerned if the roles were reversed since though he may not show it, he really does care deeply about her. Lily looks stunned for a moment, then her jaw sets, and she says she'll believe it when she hears it from Gladion himself, but that will never happen if they don't get moving and rescue him. A few minutes later, the four friends are all mounted on Charizard's back. However, this proves too much for the Flame Lizard to carry, and so Lily begins to fret. In her flustered and annoyed state, she reminds Ash of someone, though at that moment he can't pinpoint who, and it is pushed to the back of his mind when Howe requires his attention for more pressing matters. Seeing how much the success success of this mission means to Lily, the grandson of Hala shakily tries to take charge, doing his best imitation of Gladian's self-assured tones and saying the other three should ride Charizard like they presumably have already, and he'll fly with the help of his Toucanon. He then adds that this will let them cover more ground, and if he finds Gladion, he'll have Toucanon use a beat blast like a flare, and if they find him, they should do the same with Charizard's flamethrower. Kiawe promises to do just that, and the pair fist bump, before Howe brings out his Pokemon and is lifted into the air by its powerful wings and talons. 
Ash, Kiawe, and Lily then take flight, soaring over Route 11 and into the desert. At once they are beset by a sandstorm which cuts down visibility and makes flight much harder. As a fire type, Charizard is hit hard by the sandstorm, roaring in displeasure as they go deeper in. Kiawe frantically apologizes to his old friend, saying that it will only be for a little while longer, and then it can get back to resting in its Pokeball. But this gives Lily an idea, and she tells the others that what they're experiencing now isn't a natural sandstorm, since if it's damaging Charizard, it must be one caused by a Pokemon. Ash and Kiawe acknowledge this, but ask what she's getting at, to which Lily says that whatever is causing the sandstorm might be what's waylaid Gladion, so they should head into the heart of the storm if they want to find him. Kiawe says he hates to burst her bubble, but if Charizard is struggling here at the edge of the storm, how are they meant to get to the center? Lily frowns, not having an answer, but Ash steps up, saying that he has an idea. During his grand trial match against Hala, Rufflet used Tailwind, and it was able to extend to cover the whole ring and lasted for a really long time, even though Rufflet was relatively weak back then, so with some luck, it might be able to do the same to create an air pocket for Charizard while repelling the sand. The others say it's worth a shot, and so Ash brings out Rufflet. At once the little flying type is almost blown away in the high winds, and Ash has to lurch sideways to catch it. Once he has it safely braced against his chest, he tells his friend to use Tailwind with all the strength it has. Rufflet chirps its determination, and then begins vigorously flapping its wings. With a mighty gale, wind rushes out on all sides, and just as Ash had planned, it repels the sand buffeting Charizard. Without the sand to impede them, the trio are able to spot the sand of the storm and so direct Charizard to fly down as three figures begin to take shape through the sandy air. Before long, two of the three become plain to see, and they are Gladion and his Gabite. Both are sprawled on the ground, face down, and with wounds peppering their bodies. At this sight, Lily calls out to Gladion, calling him brother, and without any thought or concern for the implications. Then, even more shockingly, leaps from Charizard's back and the safety of the air pocket without any hesitation to drop quite a long way onto the packed sand. This makes our heroine grunt as the wind is knocked from her and whipping sand takes its place. But even this will not stop Lily, who clamors to her feet and trudges as fast as she can towards her brother and his Pokemon. However, as she draws near, Lily suddenly stops moving, her eyes widening and a gasp escaping her. A moment later, Ash and Kiawe see why, as Charizard brings them into plain view of the third and final figure. It is a totem Alolan golem, towering over the siblings at 10 feet tall at least, and looking like it must weigh well over a ton, glaring down at them with undeniably malicious intent. As the boys land, Kiawe has Charizard use a flamethrower to signal how, then returns it to his ball as promised. Meanwhile, Lily is roused from her stupor by the return of the air pocket, and so bends down to shake Gladion back to consciousness. Desperately, she pleads with her big brother to wake up, saying that she needs him, and whether by coincidence or not, this is the moment that Gladion is finally able to open his eyes. Lily floods the blonde girl with the sight, and she tells Gladion to recall Gabite since they need to go now, but as Gladion shakes off his confusion and gets to his feet with Lily's help, he tells her that it's impossible. When he came into Golem's territory, he issued it a challenge, and it's not going to let him go now that it has the advantage. Setting her jaw, Lily says that that's the way it's gotta be, then she'll fight alongside him, to which Gladion snarls that he won't allow it, telling her to get back to safety with her friends and that he can handle this alone. Furiously, Lily snaps back that she's tired of Gladion always running off and leaving her behind because he thinks he's better than her. With an offended look, Gladion heatedly replies that he doesn't do it because he thinks he's better than her. He does it because, but before he can complete that sentence, Golem lobs a giant boulder at the pair, causing them to dive in opposite directions. Seeing that there truly is no choice but to fight, they take their stances on either side of Golem, while Ash and Kiawe run in to add their support. As a fire-type specialist, Kiawe is well aware that his team won't be able to do much in the way of resisting Golem's rock or ground-type attacks, but even still, he has to fight, and so puts his faith in Turtonator's bulk, calling for it to come out and help them by setting up a shell trap defense. Ash, for his part, pulls out Popplio's ball, hoping its typing will make up for its inexperience in battle, but it's stopped when Lily points out that Alolan Golems are part electric, meaning all he'll manage to do is get Popplio injured. Sighing, Ash returns the ball to his belt, releasing Hawk Moa as he can only rely on it. Though for the briefest of moments, he feels a sudden pang of remorse in his heart of releasing Ponyard. This is short-lived, however, and he quickly refocuses his faith as the adolescent dragon warrior takes to the desert stands. Seeing so many foes before it, Golem attempts to squash them all with a double edge. But here, Kiawe's trap comes into effect, pushing the rocky brute back and allowing Hakamoto to take advantage of Golem's staggered state to also land a sky uppercut. Unfortunately, this only seems to tick Golem off more than it already was, and it retaliates with a thunder punch that sends the young dragon flying far enough to lose visual contact in Sandstorm. As Ash runs off to rescue his starter, Lily continues to support Gladion as she goes against his wishes and calls out Snowy to take Ash's place. Due to the training the Ice type and his trainer have gone through, both are well synchronized and actually surprise Gladion with their efficiency as they begin backing Kiawe and Turtonator up with the use of Volpix's speed and icy wind. This increases the broody boy's dismay at his own helplessness as after Gabite had fallen, he had run out of usable Pokemon, meaning all he can do is watch from behind. As the battle continues, suddenly a ball in Lily's bag 
bag bursts open, revealing her newly caught Charmander, who she decided to call Bernie, on account of the events that led to him joining her little patchwork family. Sensing the heated battle, the tiny yet scrappy fire lizard charges at Golem with metallic glowing claws. Lily had no idea it was strong enough to know Metal Claw, but this thought does little to assuage her fear, as she immediately orders Snowy to cancel its next attack and save their new friend. Instantly complying, Snowy releases his icy wind and instead speeds up to slide between Bernie's stubby legs and force it to mount his back. When he is sure Bernie is secured, Snowy darts back to Lily, depositing the little lizard before returning to the fight. After some light admonishment, Lily returns the fire starter to its ball, though in this time she is distracted and falls to Gladion to call for Snowy to watch out. Looking up, Lily sees a giant rock blast courtesy of Golem heading towards them. And though she joins her voice to Gladion's, it is too late, as both Snowy and Turtonator are finally felled by the powerful attack. The two siblings in Kiawe are forced to back away in terror, as suddenly the tandem yelling of Ash and Hakamoa is heard, as the pair run into the center of the sandstorm again, clearly having been buffeted to hell and back by the harsh sandstorm. Realizing that they're where they need to be and that they've arrived just in time, Ash and his partner seamlessly team up, with Ash grabbing hold of Hakamoa's hand and swinging the dragon around like an Olympic hammer throw, before sending his friend shooting towards Golem, only to slam into it with a literal sky uppercut. Golem staggers back, but to the dismay of everyone, it can continue battling. Growling to himself, Ash questions if even Hakamoa's mother was this tenacious, and as the warrior Drake lands at his side, both share a look that says there is no more room for holding back. He and Hakamo then begin expertly using all-out pummeling, hitting head-on with their super effective ultimate move and even causing a massive crater of sand to kick up from the force of the attack. Ash cheers and thanks Hakamo, but as soon as he turns to give Ash a thumbs up, a wall of lightning erupts from where Golem should have been unconscious and causes Hakamo to writhe in pain before dropping to the sand with swirls in its eyes. Another mighty roar then causes the sand cloud around Golem to blow away, revealing its rocky hide now scuffed and even cracked in some spots, but still ready to fight. Cold realizes of how bad the situation has gotten hits our heroes, who begin praying to Arceus that Hal will find them soon. But when he doesn't, Lily gulps that it might be time to use him. She then pulls out a Pokeball with a peculiar sticker of a cartoon explosion on it, and Ash and Kiawe somewhat fearfully state that Old Meanie could make this a hundred times worse for them. But Lily snaps back that they don't have any other options, since all their remaining Pokemon are too vulnerable to Rock Blast to be of any help. Placing all her faith in Meanie, Lily rests her forehead against his Pokeball, before sending her most powerful partner out. With a loud thud, the Tauros is released, and instantly looks around himself as Lily from behind gives a quick rundown and a plea for his help. Meanie snorts, seeming unconvinced, until noticing the totem power emanating from Golem, at which point its entire demeanor shifts, having finally found a rival amongst its own ilk. The bull then charges directly at Golem for a takedown, only to have his momentum cut when Golem retaliates with a double edge which sends Meanie skidding back in the sand. Only a size and bulk allow him to keep his footing, though despite this undesirable outcome, Meanie immediately repeats this process, earning him the same results, albeit with him coming closer to tipping this time thanks to all the accumulated damage. Recognizing this as an impossible situation where his life and the lives of good people willing to help him are in danger, Gladion makes a drastic choice, as he suddenly rips off his Z-Ring and slaps it onto Lily's arm, explaining that as it stands, her Tauros can't win, but maybe a Z-Move can change that. Holding up what he calls a Normalium Z, he quickly then runs through a set of motions that sees him dip his upper body for a bit only to form his arms into the shape of a Z. He then hastily tells his sister to replicate that, before suddenly running headlong into danger to hop on Meanie's back. Urgently, Lily cries for him to stop, but with a smile that seems more fitting on Hal than himself, Gladion urges her to trust him. Whispering that she always has, Lily takes her position and begins to carry out the dance. In that moment, a strange sense of confidence fills her, and she feels connected not only to Meanie, but also Gladion. Drawing on this, Lily channels her Z-Power into the normal type, and as energy fills Meanie, he feels more powerful than ever before, recognizing that he could get used to this whole Bond thing, and then rapidly begins a breakneck blitz, directly towards the oversized Golem, whose eyes widen in surprise at the unexpected second Z-Move. Gladion hangs on for dear life until the moment of impact, jumping off just as Meanie lowers his head and brings his incredibly dense skull crashing into Golem at center mass. This on top of all the other damage is too much for the creature, and its eyes roll backwards as it is given a taste of its own medicine, being sent flying only to be followed by a perfectly placed throw of an Ultra Ball from Gladion. As the Ultra Ball hits the sand with a soft puff, Gladion bends down to pick it up before stowing it on his belt. At this point, Hal arrives in the scene, bemoaning the fact that he missed an awesome battle because two cannon kept getting blown off course. Lily smiles that at least he got here in the end, which is what matters, while Gladion looks up at him, then to all the others, before humbly thanking them for coming out here to look for him, since he doesn't know what would have happened if they hadn't. Ash shrugs this off, saying that he shouldn't be so surprised. He's their friend and he was in trouble, so of course they'd come to help him. Nonetheless, Gladion remains great 
grateful, saying that he's not sure how he can repay them. Grinning widely, Kiawe says he thinks Ash might know a way, and so Ash explains their plan to retake Po Town. Gladion immediately agrees to help, before suggesting that if they need powerful allies, perhaps they should try and recruit the trainer who beat him, since he was on a whole other level. He then explains that when he first saw this trainer sneaking around near Aether House, he looked like he was up to no good, and so Gladion challenged him to battle, but despite his best efforts, he was defeated without knocking out a single one of the stranger's Pokemon. Ash can't help but empathize, but before he can express his solidarity with Gladion, Lily cuts in, demanding to know what Gladion was doing near Aether House. How is the one who answers that question, saying that Gladion was sneaking around, playfully throwing Gladion's words back in his face. Gladion scowls and tells how to zip it, but just like with Acerola and Nanu, Ash can see that beneath the bickering these two boys now share a deep bond. Ash then asks if Gladion has any ideas where this strong trainer is, and once again it is How who answers for his friend. He eagerly says that he knows, since the last thing the mystery trainer said before departing was something about waiting for a real challenge at the Lake of the Moon. Ash excitedly thanks How for this crucial clue, for telling Kiawe and Lily they should head there right now. However, Kiawe flatly refuses this request, saying that Charizard and several of their other Pokemon are all exhausted, so they should take tonight to rest and try to find this guy tomorrow. Ash frowns that he really wanted to go to Po Town tonight, but Lily clearly agrees with Kiawe and reminds Ash of what Nanu told him about taking the time to formulate a proper strategy. Ash has no recourse against such ironclad logic, and so with his head hung low, concedes. Lily then tells How and Gladion that they should come with them to the Pokemon Center, since their Pokemon could also use a checkup. But when Gladion realizes his sister is speaking to him outside of the heat of battle, he drops his gaze and looks furtive, saying that he and How have their accommodation sorted, but they'll meet up again when they're needed. He then brings out an oddly colored Howlucha and allows it to pull him into the air, while How does the same with his two cannon, leaving behind a disappointed Lily, who vows that next time they meet, they will have a real talk. The next morning, when all their Pokemon are back to full health, Ash, Lily, and Kiawe set off to find the Lake of the Moon. Thanks to Lily's guidebook, it doesn't take them too long to find it, and more importantly, the ruins sitting at the center where the trainer who beat Gladion will presumably be waiting. Idly, Ash comments how much his mom would love to see this place, but such thoughts are all forgotten when the trio see blue and purple light rend the sky as white lightning arcs out. Ash recognizes this as the anomaly he saw back in the helicopter, and so rushes up the stairs, desperate to find out what this strange light is, and whether it has anything to do with this mystery trainer. However, by the time he and his friends reach the top, the anomaly has faded, and all that is left is a battered and bruised Rudigan, and beside it, an equally defeated looking Ryuki. And that's where we'll leave things. What is Ryuki's connection to the strange wormholes? Will he assist them in their battle with Team Skull? And can our heroes liberate Po Town so that Ash can have his grand trial battle? Find out as, as the, the journey, journey continues. continues.